Today we're going to be talking about mold illness and some of the many ways that it affects our neurological system with symptoms that you might recognize in yourself. My guest today is Lisa McDonald. She's a clinical naturopath and academic lecturer and a board member for the Australian Register of Naturopaths and Herbalists. In addition to her naturopathic qualification, she also holds a bachelor degree in psychology and is currently completing her advanced master's degree in naturopathy through Southern Cross Uni in Australia. She has a personal background with chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which we are going to talk about. And it became her passion to help others that were in situations like hers and couldn't find any answers. She's one of the few naturopaths in Australia that have gone on to do further study in chronic inflammatory response syndrome, also known as mold illness for many. Um, and so she's learned a lot about how to treat this as a multi-system illness. Lisa is a serial learner and her knowledge in nutrigenomics, psychology, functional medicine, SERS protocols makes her an absolute expert on this subject and I'm absolutely thrilled to be talking about it with her today. She's helped hundreds of patients navigate mold illness and I thank her very much for taking the time to share her experience with us today. All right. So thank you so much for joining me for this chat, Lisa. It's a really important topic, I feel, and one that doesn't get nearly enough airtime. And that is those connections between mold illness and how it can affect our neurological health or just our health generally. And obviously for a lot of years, I know for us, we've both been naturopaths for a, a few decades. Um, so mold illness for a while there really felt quite fringe and really under-recognized. And let's talk about how it became a really big deal on your radar and why this is now something you specialize in. Yeah, well, look, first of all, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about this because I think you're right, the more information that's out there and the more that people have an opportunity to understand um, if their environment is actually impacting their health is super important. So, so I guess what happened for me was, you know, over a decade now, uh, was that it really was something that impacted both um, my son and myself, and um, not so much the other family members, but probably in different ways. But my son um, had the world's worst eczema you've ever seen, um, head to toe eczema, um, no matter what I did, um, both conventional and naturopathically, it just didn't, um, wasn't resolved. Um, and to the point, it was so bad that, you know, I think the last thing that the conventional medicine could offer for us at the time was just ongoing prophylactic um, antibiotics, some experimental injections and cyclosporin, which is a uh, immunosuppressant drug. Now, he was only two. Um, so, yeah. you know, full on. Um, and uh, so and it took us a long time to figure out that it was the house because we'd actually done a whole massive renovation of um, an old cottage and it, we'd ripped up everything up the you know and everything uh, all the carpet etc and everything was low box so we had you know bio paint on the walls bio oil on the floors you know so it was kind of like the last thing to have considered mm -hmm. um, and then meanwhile while he was unwell I was it was kind of creeping up on me in terms of you know some of the symptoms I was getting so I was starting to get forgetful I forget people's names I couldn't integrate new information I um, would burn things on the stove I would forget pin numbers that I hadn't that I'd had for you know a long time um, I'd get really cranky um, so over the period of time of course you know I'd sort of notice and then I'd think oh well, maybe I've got a blood sugar problem or maybe I've got a thyroid problem you know and there's all this stuff and thinking oh no and um, and then eventually um, in my, you know, deep dive, as you do when you have <laughs> health issues on, that I came across Dr. Schumacher's work. And so that's how I got to be trained by um, Dr. Schumacher. And then, of course, we recognised that there was actually mould. And by that stage, we had actually got mould on the walls um, in our bedrooms. And, you know, being the good naturopath, you know, I, I was at the time thinking, oh, well, I'll just use um, white vinegar and and um, clove oil to wipe that off. And then, of course, it would all grow back in the in the white marks of me trying to get rid of it. So, hmm. um, so yeah, so that's how I sort of came across it, did the training. Um, and then, you know, we spent a long time trying to get out of there because, of course, the other thing it impacts is things like your ability to plan, like your cog executive cognitive functioning. So being able to think, 
oh, I've got to do this, this and this and actually plan and execute that is a real struggle because your brain just can't bring things together. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then there's the overwhelm. It's almost like, it's almost a little bit similar to what one might experience with a combination of like, you know, dementia and, and uh, attention deficit. You know, it's kind of like not being able, that executive function really um, is quite impaired. So anyway, took us a while to get out of there and, and we eventually did. And, um, you know, my son now is a, a an elite athlete and he looks awesome and his skin's awesome and um, we got through it. Um, mm. The only thing that's still outstanding, I guess, is a little bit of anaphylaxis, but, you know, that's a work in progress. But, yeah, that's how it came into my life, basically. Yeah. Um, because of that, you know, I feel like I have on an ongoing basis over that decade have just progressively always kept up with whatever the latest is because it is a growing uh, you know the research on this is um continuing um yeah. and also I will, of course, <clears throat> I will pop some um links for um anyone who wants to have a look into Dr Richard Schumacher's work because he's kind of a bit of a pioneer when it comes to mold illness and he does provide training for clinicians like Lisa has done and um, I, I suppose we should say, too, uh, that, you know, mold illness is kind of a colloquial term, but it has more of a clinical term that we use and it probably encompasses more about what it actually does. And do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So I guess I referenced Dr. Schumacher's work because that was something that was quite pioneering and new in terms of how we looked at the impact of mold. And that and he, the term that he coined was chronic inflammatory response syndrome or SIRS. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the many ways that you can be affected by mold. And um, and what that describes is a whole um, chronic inflammatory um, response that really triggers off the innate immune system, mm -hmm. um, at, which is really systemic. So it, it affects quite a number of different systems in the body. So it's not just neural, but there's a whole lot of other things that impacts like gut and um, et cetera. So um, it's not just um, brain function, but there's a lot of other things that happen as well, including hormones as well. So it's quite... Um, extensive and multi-system there mm -hmm. are just while we're on the topic there are two other ways also that mold impact that um, um exposure to mold can also affect um, people and that can be also an allergy to mold so mm -hmm. when i talk about chronic inflammatory response syndrome that's actually not allergy because that's more the innate immune system whereas allergy is more what we call the adaptive uh, adaptive immune system so often people will be in a moldy environment and get all these symptoms and then they think oh and they can see some sort of correlation to mold. And so they'll go to the doctor and go, oh, I think I'm allergic to mold. I keep getting all these symptoms. Mm. They'll have an allergy test for mold. It comes back normal. So that's more the inflammatory side. But people can also have be allergic as well. And then thirdly, people can also be what we call um, colonised. So you can actually, by um, inhaling the mold, you can actually get it into your lungs. And so some people could develop aspergillosis. So that's the joy of <laughs> mold. Um, but yeah, you're right. There is that like that colloquial term we call mold illness. But really, a lot of what I work on is the chronic inflammatory response syndrome to mold. Yeah. And so <clears throat> it's kind of like, I suppose it's like peeling back those layers to the onion, because when you're talking about a systemic, as in like a body wide inflammatory process, yeah. I'm guessing that that looks different on everybody. So how do you teach people to pick it up? How do you recognize it? Especially too, because I think for me, something I notice people say is if you su suggest that you could have a mold problem, they're like, oh no, I, there's no mold in my house or my mm. workplace. Mm. So I think the key thing, there's a couple of key things, is that one, if you're being treated for one particular thing, like, for example, if you're doing uh, having treatment for SIBO, which is a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, like a gut issue, and that just keeps happening over and over again, like if you get this, um, or if you're sort of thinking that you're going through menopause and then treatment for that isn't necessarily working. So often you can spot it when um, when whatever treatment you're having isn't necessarily working. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing too is that if it's multi-system, so if you've got um, neural issues as well as hormone issues, as well as gut issues, um, as well as et cetera, et cetera. So you kind of can spot it when it's sort of multi-system. And the other thing too is if you just actually feel like there's a whole lot of stuff wrong with you and no one can find any answers and you have symptoms that are right across the board, that's also a red flag. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and it's, yeah, so it's, 
uh, in terms of identifying it, you really need to see someone who's skilled or trained in, in mold illness, to be honest, um, who really know how to be able to um, catch it because a lot of it is about um, looking at your specific case. Mm. Um, but, but you're right, it does look different with different people. So if I was to give an example, if a whole family is in, an, in a home that has mould and sometimes it's not visible, sometimes it's in between the walls or in the ceiling, we don't know it's there. Or under flooring as well. Or under flooring. And mm. so in our case, in our house, the first time around, that was actually a, 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 um, a subfloor where sewerage was actually coming up underneath oh, um, from, from the property behind us. Oh, <laughs> um, yes. Um, so... Uh, so, you know, for example, in our household, we saw my son have allergies. I had the neural stuff. My husband ended up getting a bit of rosacea on his face, but he was not there much because he commuted a lot for, you know, interstate for work. Mm -hmm. And my daughter, she'd get hair loss and food intolerances and things like that. So it's Best different. Gym. You know, mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes one person in the family will be really wiped out from an inflammatory perspective and everyone else will be normal. So sometimes people sort of come to me by the time they come to me, they might feel a little bit, for want of a better term, gaslit in that, you know, they they know there's something wrong with them. They've got all these symptoms. Mm. And if someone says mole, they go, well, I'm not sick and we're living in the same house, you know. And so sometimes their partners aren't always supportive, but it mm. can actually be different for different people. Um, and not everyone will get an inflammatory response. And some of that comes down to, I know, um, something that I know you're also very well versed on is um, genetics. So people can have like a higher susceptibility depending on what genes they carry. So that's why we can see these kind of variances and particularly, you know, difference, like a difference between each of the family members. Yes, that's right. So one of the um, key genes that you can look at is the HLA, DQ and DR gene, which um, is also associated with celiac, but it's actually different haplotypes that are associated with mold illness, not necessarily celiac. So it's, mm -hmm. if you're celiac, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, you have mold illness, it's like slightly different haplotypes. But um, yeah, and that's why you do see that um, difference. And But having said that, in practice, I also see people having um, SIRS that don't necessarily have those genes. So probably 95% of the patients will have those genes yeah. um, and others that will just be unlucky. Be unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that because, yeah, that's exactly right. Like if you've got mold illness and I suppose something that we should talk about as well is like it's it's life altering. Like it's not just as simple as you said as cleaning with white vinegar and clove oil. Like in some cases people have to literally throw out all their belongings. Like absolutely everything in the home can be affected by mold spores that have been circulating in the air, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and look, that's a really important point because often people um, have um, health issues and they may not necessarily have um, have significant mould in their current home, but it might have been in the previous home and all their home contents that they brought with them to the current home have actually been contaminated. So one of the key things is that you know, I say to patients, you know, mould doesn't know the difference between run one room to the other. It doesn't know to stay in one room. Mm. It it's it's it, it wants to proliferate. It's a it's an organism, and so it's wanting its spores to be everywhere it possibly can. So just moving in movement between one room to another can move things around, um, and uh, and also um, it can be within. Um, um, furniture or and soft furnishing so even if there's not necessarily visible mold on the surface of something that may actually be in it mm -hmm. um, so yeah it's such a problem I mean one of the things that see, this is one of the problems I had for me is that we didn't know that stuff so much so we've done it to ourselves twice mm -hmm. um, and some of things like books for example and they might, might look moldy but they'll just have like these little brown dots on the outside yep. and they bring it into the new house and off we go it's it's like it's like mold prebiotic. Mm. <laughs> Your yeah, give it the right environment and it will yeah. thrive. We obviously have a lot of um, people in Australia that are um, both impacted by this now and potentially impacted more about this in the future because of all of the flooding and we have such a humid climate. So I think something like this, this area of, of clinical practice is only going to probably expand as time goes on. Yes, that's correct. I, look, I think the more awareness that, that people have as well, not just practitioners, but also 
that you know it's not okay just to just to wipe it down you actually need to remove the the water damaged materials like it's quite extensive and um and there's some level some level of regulation in terms of mold remediators but not necessarily to the point of um being aware of the level it needs to be done for someone who's suffering from SIRS mm -hmm. um so yeah it's a bit it's a major problem and I think I'd probably have to say I'm, I'm you know, had heart palpitations watching those floods up up in the northern rivers, for example, because I was just thinking, you know, that's just epic. That's just really, you know, going to impact a lot of people. So, mm. yes, it's really important for people to be aware of it. Um, I do have on my website a, a few webinars that I have um, done in the past mm -hmm. for practitioners to start to become aware of it, and there'll be more to come as well. So, definitely, the more practitioners that are aware of it, the better. Definitely. Um, and the other thing too is that there is a study that's being done at Macquarie Uni at the moment because we're trying to get more data to enable the actual condition to be recognised by conventional medicine as well. So we're probably, you know what research is like, five to ten years away from that. But yeah. also the more that conventional medicine practitioners are aware, the better as well. So in terms of conventional medicine, I mean, is it, there are so you're suggesting there's no recognition for it as an as an illness so therefore if there's no recognition for it as an illness I'm assuming conventional medicine also offers no treatment options yeah basically because it's not a recognized condition um one there's no training necessarily provided to conventional medicine practitioners but also then it's not necessarily um picked up um, it, it picked up in clinic and it's also then not believed so even if patients do figure that that might be what they have if they went to a conventional practitioner uh, they are unlikely to think that will be not even know that that um, condition exists basically and so yeah. unfortunately what happens is a lot of patients go I know there's something wrong I know there's something wrong with my house and they basically get told it's in their head so um, and then get put on a roundabout of either perhaps antidepressants or psychological support that kind of thing when what they right. really need is probably a bit, something a bit more physical that's right mm. Mm. that's a, that's a real um it's like I can only see that that's that would be so frustrating for people if they were living that circumstance I just makes me yeah. really sad I know and I mean and I think that sometimes too we know when patients come to me you know sometimes even just the validation in itself is a good is a first step towards healing as well because it's not fun walking around you know thinking of brainlessness you know there's something wrong yeah. um and everyone tells you it's just stress or it's just in your head it's yeah it's yeah uh, so I'm particularly interested in chatting about um, how this, because a lot of those symptoms you described, even the ones you experienced yourself, they really model like these early dementia kind of um, things, like things like forgetting your own name or walking into a room and forgetting what you went there for, or like you said, leaving things on the stove, like this forgetfulness. Or And I'm sure that um, many of us have been gaslit by that as well. You know, like, oh my God, you're so forget forgetful. Or, you never listen to me. Like, I'm sure people hear that th that kind of thing all the time and have probably never really thought about the fact that actually there could be neuroinflammation going on and there might be a trigger like mold. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the key things it does is that it does trigger off this neuroinflammation. And I think even, um, you know, the studies by Dr. Dale Bredesen, who's done a lot of work on Alzheimer's, he's actually got a subclass called inhalation um, Alzheimer's, which is predominantly in his view too, is from um, exposure to mycotoxins. So there is definitely um, some research out there that associates neuroinflammation with in inhalation of, of mycotoxins. Mm. So that's one way. So it's kind of like, so there's a quite a number of ways that it, it impacts. And so impact. So one is like just the basic oxidative stress element. So the basics like, you know, setting off oxidative stress, then in impacting the brain. Um, you've got things like the neuroimmune access where it actually in a lot of uh, patients who are exposed to mycotoxins they also go on to develop mast cell activation and there's a lot of um, and that impacts the microglia in the brain mm -hmm. and so what we find is this is this activation of mast cells and then you've got this neuroimmune impact where you've got this whole brain inflammation going on which then impacts things like attention and concentration and memory. Um, 
Then the other thing is it impacts, I guess, mitochondria as well, So, um, which is also really important for brain function um, and cognitive impairment. So it affects um, mitochondria. Um, yeah, so there's quite a few things. And then there's the other part of it too, is it's indirectly affects in that, for example, it affects the um, the gut. So it can affect the actual mycotoxins impact the actual gut lining. Um, it can it can change the microbiome in your gut. And we when we know that there's a relationship between the microbiome and brain function, so there's an indirect uh, um, response. It changes our hormones. So again, if you're going to if your hormones are going to bottom out, which often happens, or you you have excess um, estrogen, again that affects mood emotion um, and cognitive ability. Um, what else? Oh yeah, microcirculation in the vascular system, so the oxygenation to the brain. So there's quite a few direct and indirect um, ways that it affects the, um, the neural system of the brain. Yeah, so some people might even feel, um, and this is true of a lot of neurological illnesses as well, like tingling in the fingers and toes and limbs or changes maybe even in the um, ability to control temperature, like hands might be hot or cold, that kind of thing. Yes, that's right. So you do get numbing and tingling in the hands. And actually that was one of the things I had to, when, um, which was odd, um, which made me keep looking too, because um, it was just that little bit further of it <laughs> than just like a normal thing that would happen. So yes, there is that neural element. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. And dizziness as well, vertigo, it affects as well. So it just, the list goes on. <laughs> Yeah. So um, aside from avoiding mould, <laughs> what are some things that people can do uh, or what's your best advice for you? Like you think you've got mould illness, uh, what do I do now? <laughs> um, well, I think if, you, if if some of these symptoms are resonating um, with you, I think I definitely seek out a practitioner that is a, uh, has an expertise in mould um, and a mould illness per se or SIRS and that they can really do a good case and, and sort of unpack what might be happening. Mm. Uh, the other thing is though, um, is that uh, um, also to as part of that process, make sure you get someone out to actually assess your home because you might be sitting in a place that looks, might be brand new and might be pristine all around you. And you think, nah, there's no way it's going to be mold because I know that there's no mold in this house. Well, you'd be very surprised to know that that's actually not necessarily the case. And mm. Even in the second time it happened to me, um, I had a pristine white um, uh, clinic and I even had a um, particular air filter in, in the room just in case. But again, it still got, uh, it was actually um, water damaged, which I wasn't aware of. So a lot of it is about um, getting the right people to come in and actually assess your home. Even if you can't see any mould, it could actually, like you said before, could be under the under the um in the subfloor it could be in the roof it could be even in the walls in between mm. I, I i had a patient actually who was a an electrician and he was and he does a lot of new builds and he was telling me um how much when he goes to put all the wiring and stuff in all the walls how much he sees black mold actually inside some of the new builds so in new not, builds. wow yeah. yeah because if you think a lot of the frames are left out in the rain you know mm. Um, for so long and then it, they're not necessarily perfectly dry when they then start building on top so mm. um, so just because you're a new place doesn't necessarily mean um, it's mold free um, but anyway apart from that yes important to get away from the mold because it's uh, the analogy to me is like it's saying to someone oh yeah I can totally you know support you health wise while you're still living in a, in a walls with exposed asbestos you know what I mean like you kind of need to do the, your best to try yeah. and get away from it but then, the, then we've got to think about, well, how we can move those mycotoxins because actually the mycotoxins of the mould that actually is more the problem. Mm. Um, and they get given off when you try and kill it. So when you try and kill mould, it actually releases more mycotoxins. So I wouldn't recommend to actually go around madly now your house and spray get the <laughs> mould remover out because it's going to release all this uh, mycotoxins and that will make you sicker. So you need to do that to have a professional. But so, um, so yeah, detoxification pathways is really important, particularly things like glucuronidation um, and so, uh, and also bile production because that's where the mycotoxins get recirculated in the um, system. So making sure that you have foods and herbs and nutrients that in, um, help with bile mm -hmm. function. Um, you know, reducing inflammation. So interventions to help with um, reducing inflammation 
interventions to help with mitochondria because we still need to try and have our brains back in the meantime. So supporting mm. mitochondria and brain function is really important. So they're probably like the, the you top. know, the top liners. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So from a naturopathic perspective, what are the kinds of like herbs and nutrients that I guess you reach for when you're um, supporting people with mold illness? Well, I think um, some of the key things, particularly when it comes to brain function, um, I tend to use things like the, the phosphatidylcholine or phosphatidylserine, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. Um, lion's mane is really important. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful for people's brain function and memory. Yeah. Uh, astaxanthin, I think, is a bit of a, a one that I don't think people know enough about and mm. use enough. I think astaxanthin is awesome. It's got some uh, amazing research too. Like it just keeps coming out with more cool stuff that you can use it for. I know. And I think... Um, Originally, I think I came across it for eye health, I think, before, you know, a long time ago, but I've really found it really good for cognition as well. And of course, one of the other symptoms of mold is also blurred vision. So um, astaxanthin mm. is really helpful for that. Oh, and, and of course, we've got ubiquinol or CoQ10, which is also really important for both mitochondria uh, and brain function. The other thing that's in terms of that whole inflammatory issue, I like to use quercetin. Mm -hmm. uh, and quercetin as actually... There's some good research on the link between quercetin reducing mass uh, mast cells and um, inflammation, and therefore um, helping with neural um, uh, neural ability. So I think mm -hmm. quercetin is probably one of my favourites. Yeah. Uh, then you can use things like um, ginkgo and Sonara scolamus, which is globe artichoke, which is also really awesome because that helps you to produce bile as well. So it's not so, which is really important as part of detoxification. So they're probably a couple of the ones that I use yep yep perfect and is there any crossover with um dietary um things as well like do we do you see that there's if somebody's got a mold on this that they'll typically react to certain foods or anything like that yeah so part of um part of SIRS often people do develop sensitivities Generally speaking, um, what's in Dr. Schumacher's work, but of course, you know, there's other thought leaders and I mean, I also integrate naturopathy into that since then. But, you know, generally speaking, probably gluten's probably not fab, but um, but you, but often they develop further intolerances because not only is their gut affected, but also you've got the mast cell activation um, going on as well. So people will become more um, sensitive to foods. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, in terms of a diet, if someone has mold illness, there's no specific mold diet per se. You may you may spot one on the internet, but to be honest, it's really the person that's in front of you. And generally speaking, they'll probably need to be on a low histamine because histamine gets released a lot as part of the mast cell activation. So you're, you kind of want to have a low inflammatory diet. So, you mm -hmm. know, looking at histamine, reducing histamines, um, sometimes depending on what the the symptoms that they're getting they may need support in terms of making sure they have consistent protein and good fats and things like that so that um, we can help with the brain function mm -hmm. um, and also the amino acids that are helpful for um, brain function as well so there's no um, you know one diet but generally speaking it would be it would be low histamine sometimes a low SIBO diet yeah. um, and probably no gluten and then Dairy can also be inflammatory, so it just depends on the person that's sitting from them, but they're kind of like the top liners. Yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. And so for people who don't want to navigate um, this on their own, how can they find you and or people like you? Mm -hmm. um, so if you go to my website, lisamcdonald.com.au, uh, on that website there'll be all the information about how to work with me uh, and I would also recommend going and having a look at um, Toxic Mould Australia. They have a website as well that lists other practitioners as well who are um, Dr. Schumacher trained plus. Okay. Uh, so I'll make sure probably... I put these in the notes, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And I would really be, um, and I would go to that website particularly to look for someone who's a, an assessor or a remediator because it's very hard navigating people out there that know to the level that needs to be reviewed mm. uh, but yeah there's there's resources on my website as well yeah so and is that um for people that do assessment that are they building biologists that that do like the the um top like the mold assessment of buildings or is it a different a different profession 
Um, uh, building biologists, yes, they can go out and um, do an assessment. Mm -hmm. um, there are also a couple of other people out there that are also um, assessors. Um, they also have a building background as well. So mm -hmm. a lot of the building biologists um, uh, don't necessarily have a building background. So I think it depends on, you know, where you're at in your journey. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, and I think that whoever you come, you get to come out, I would make sure that they're going to do a full report with photos and do air sampling, et cetera, if you can try and afford that as much as possible, because it's really important to understand what that is to then help with the remediation. But if someone was going to come out and look around and go, oh, I can't see any mould, let's just fog it and off you go, I would be running a mile. So, um, And whose responsibility is it if, if someone's a renter, is it up to the homeowner or the tenant to kind of do these assessments? Well, that is a Pandora's box. <laughs> that would be an hour conversation. Uh, so, you know, the rental um, laws between different are uh, different for different states. Mm -hmm. And one, because this is an illness that's not um, recognised, uh, it's very difficult to get any sort of necessarily any support to the level that they might need. Yeah. Um, and often, you know, there is arguments between whose fault is it as to why mould is there. Often it's usually put on the tenant in that, that they didn't clean enough or they didn't air out the house enough or what have you. But really to get rid of mould, you actually need to get to the source of what's causing the, causing the water ingress, which in my opinion would be more to do with the landlord. So... Mm -hmm. They're usually the the battles. <laughs> yeah, the battles and on happen. a case by case basis, obviously, like if that person's hanging six loads of washing inside their house, and that that's giving off what is it? The average load of washing that you hang out can dissipate about five liters of water into the air. That some yeah, kind of, I remember that fact from environmental medicine thing. I, I went know. To. Uh, well, and you know the other classic, the other thing that I did in the first time it happened to us, I would like cringe when I think about it, is that my son, you know, was starting to have respiratory problems. So what do you do when you're a naturopath and they got you put on a humidifier, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're putting on this steam in the room mm -hmm. to try and help with the cough. Yet I was with that extra moisture in the air, I was basically creating a beautiful environment for mold to come. Yeah, into you just yeah sort of took took to the to um the fire with some gasoline, didn't you? Oh, Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All, all, all these things better, in, right? hind, in hindsight. Yes. I know. Things. And I look, know. and the other thing I didn't know was, you know, with even the white vinegar actually feeds mold. So, you know, using the white vinegar and the, and the clove oil actually wasn't a fabulous thing to do. Um, right. And the bio paint that we had, we didn't realize that actually has casein in it, which mold also found delicious as well. So there's a lot of things I thought I was doing the right thing actually contributed to the problem. Oh, how frustrating. You need to write a book, Lisa. I do. I do. Yes. I write that down. Oh, yeah, write that down. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough for sharing your expertise on this subject because I think, like I said, it's a massive area and it's completely underrecognized. But especially, you know, working in this scope of like brain health and brain well being, I actually think it's this insidious, unseen fact in a lot of people's, you know, brain fog, dementia, forgetfulness, you know, lack of attention to detail, not listening to their partners, whatever it might be. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I can't thank you enough for joining me. Oh, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to talk about it. Thank you so much. Thank you.